Hello and welcome to Sophie Ridge on Sunday. Well, according to the House Secretary, we're about to be tested in a way that our generation has never been tested before. Supermarkets are limiting sales, events are being cancelled and entire countries are going into lockdown. And as the scale of the challenge from coronavirus is made clear, we'll be speaking to those at the very heart of the UK's response and trying to get the answers that you want to know. We'll be talking first to the House Secretary, Matt Hancock, who will explain what the government is doing and why. We'll also hear from Labour's Shadow Health Secretary, Jonathan Ashworth, on what he thinks of the UK's preparations. The government's been relying on a pool of experts. The former Chief Scientific Advisor, Sir Mark Walport, is now heading up the work to fund a vaccine, and he will be with us in the studio. One of the first places coronavirus spread is Parliament. The SNP's Lisa Cameron is self-isolating with symptoms of the virus. She'll talk to us from her home. Prisons have been a flashpoint of the crisis in Iran and Italy. So what could happen here? Steve Gillen of the Prison Officers Association will be joining us. And finally, the chair of the British Medical Association, Dr Chand Nagpal, will give us the facts about how prepared the NHS really is. But first, we're joined now from central London by the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, the man who's been at the heart of the government's response to the pandemic. So let's go straight to uh, Matt Hancock, shall we? Now, thank you very much for being on the programme. Lots of questions that our viewers uh, want to know the answers to uh, this morning. You've of said course. today in the Sunday Telegraph that our generation has never been tested like this and the UK must pull together like it did during the Second World War. Is this a crisis like we've never seen since World War II? I, I think it is one of the biggest challenges that we've faced for a generation. Um, we've been through worse as a country, of course we have, but it is a very significant challenge. You know, the, the measures that we're, that we're taking, the measures that we're looking at taking, are very, very significant and they will, they will disrupt the ordinary lives of almost everybody in the country in order to tackle this virus and I think it is a, a big challenge as the country you know this is a national effort of course we in government have got a huge uh, weight of responsibility to get the response right uh, but and the NHS has got an, an extraordinary extraordinary time ahead of it and I'm sure that it will rise to that challenge but it won't be easy uh, but every single person can act and I was on your program a couple of weeks ago and saying everyone can act uh, by washing their hands. We'll take the right action at the right time nationally and we will be asking people to do, uh, to do more than that in order to prevent the spread of this disease. You know, our objective is to protect life and that's why we're going to be taking some of the measures that we're, that we're taking, all set out in the action plan a couple of weeks ago, uh, but uh, the, the time is coming. Um, you say that the time has come, and certainly, even in that space of just a couple of weeks, it does feel uh, as if the situation we're in today has rapidly changed from, you know, just singing happy birthday while washing your hands, important though that is. What exactly are you asking people to do then? You're saying that you're going to be stepping up the response. Well, uh, don't forget that washing your hands is still the single most important thing that anybody could do. Everybody should be washing their hands more often. That stops the, slows the spread, um, it kills the virus, and it's incredibly important to wash your hands while singing happy birthday. So let's not forget that that, that is absolutely central. Um, but we also need to take steps to protect the vulnerable. And we set out in the plan how we would be prepared to do that and to advise the elderly and the vulnerable who are most at risk from this virus uh, to, uh, to protect themselves, to shield themselves by self-isolating. And um, we'll be setting out um, when that's necessary. We don't want to do that too soon because if we do, uh, it, it's clearly you know, not an easy thing for people to do. It's not an easy thing for people to sustain. But the critical thing is we need to be ready and we, everybody as a community needs to be ready to support the people who are being shielded for their own protection, uh, the elderly and the vulnerable. I'm keen to talk more about this shielding um, because there'll be lots of people watching who'll be wanting to know exactly what this means in practice. So there are reports that the government is going to be asking people over the age of 70 to self-isolate, to stay at home for up to four months. Is that right? Well, the answer to that is not yet. And the reason that we are not saying that yet is just because this length of time 
uh, that people would have to take that action to protect but themselves is, it happen at some point? Uh, is, is very long. Um, it, that is in the plan, yes, it's clearly in the action plan. The thing that we're saying today is that we need a national effort also to help prepare the NHS. So we've been working to buy as many ventilators as we can because that's one of the critical things that's needed for people who are ill. I'm and keen to talk today, about that in the a Prime moment. Minister is I'm keen to talk about right. that in a moment, just, but just to be crystal clear on the elderly, the government will be asking the over 70s to self-isolate, potentially for a period of months, at some point in the future. Uh, that is in the action plan, yes, and we'll be setting it out uh, with more detail when that's the right, it, it's the right time to do so, uh, because we absolutely appreciate that it is, uh, that is a very big uh, ask of, uh, of the elderly and the vulnerable, and it's for their own self-protection. Are we talking about days, weeks away? How, how long are we talking? Well, certainly in the, in the coming weeks, absolutely. OK, thank you. Now, I'm keen as well to talk about what you were just saying there about effectively asking yeah. British manufacturers to be put on a war footing, if you like, to turn their production lines over to start producing these yes. ventilators. So how many ventilators yeah. do we have and how many do we need? Well, uh, we have around, we start with around uh, 5,000 ventilators. Uh, we think we need many times more than that. And we're, sa we're saying that uh, if you produce a ventilator, then we will buy it. Uh, no number is too high. Um, and um, we, we're working with companies, uh, we've been working with them for some time, both to buy ventilators that are available, uh, but also to switch over production to ventilators and other critical equipment um, like uh, personal protection equipment, for instance. But the ventilators are the big thing. They are, you know, they're, they're, re they're, they're, they're relatively complicated pieces of kit. Uh, I couldn't make one, but they're not so complicated that the, that the advanced manufacturing that this country is so good at now uh, can't be able to turn its production lines over to. We've been talking to a whole host of uh, companies about it, and the Prime Minister's hosting a conference call today with them to, to say very clearly to the nation's manufacturers, uh, ventilators are the thing that we are going to need. Um, and frankly, right across the world, the, 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 the demand for them is incredibly high. So it is not possible to produce too many. So anybody who can should turn their production and their engineering minds over to the production of ventilators. So we have 5,000 ventilators. Other countries have many times more. Can you guarantee that everybody who needs a ventilator will get one? Well, that is absolutely the task, to reduce the spread of this virus and to build up the capacity in the NHS at the same time. It's not only the physical machines we need, we also need the trained people to use them. And we're currently retraining doctors into the use of ventilators because so we we're going have to have to... That's, that's the frank truth of it, isn't um, it? We don't have enough ventilators. Well, we need we need more. Absolutely. I mean, we wouldn't be putting out this call if if this wasn't the the core piece of equipment that we need to to, to help people through this virus. You know, as health secretary, my number one task is to protect lives. And we do that by protecting the vulnerable and protecting the NHS. And the thing that the NHS needs now more than anything is more ventilators. We've been buying as many as we can, but we need to produce more too, uh, because it's clear that whilst we need more here too, so does everybody else across the world. So we can't guarantee, can we, that everyone who needs a ventilator will get one? Well, you've heard me say many times that we don't make guarantees in healthcare. Um, this, is, this virus is clearly uh, a, 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 a huge challenge and we're learning about it every day. So I don't make guarantees like that. What I will guarantee is we will do everything we possibly can to protect life and to keep people safe. But this is a very, very significant uh, challenge. And you know, there are, you've seen in some other countries around the world uh, where it hasn't gone well. Um, thankfully so far, since the uh, early days of the virus, the 
the rate of increase here in the UK is lower than other European countries. That's because of the brilliant work of Public Health England and their contact tracing. It's also because we've been doing more testing than almost any other country in the world outside of China and South Korea and Italy, the major epicenters. Um, and that testing it, it, capacity is expanding rapidly as well. In fact, there's, a, there's another big industrial challenge which we're working on with industry, which is to have to get more tests and in particular a test that can be done by the bedside rather than a test that has to go uh, to the lab. Everybody around the world is, uh, is crying out for that and we've been working for several months now with testing companies to get that testing capability. Um, so the response thus far uh, has been uh, an incredible amount of work but has, uh, has helped to slow the spread. But clearly this virus is a very, very significant problem. And so uh, we are, uh, we're, we're throwing everything at it. And um, there's talk about the government trying to pass emergency powers uh, next week uh, in Parliament so it can do more. Uh, for example, allowing police to detain uh, infected people, forcing schools and nurseries to stay open. What, what are those emergency powers going to be? Yes, we're going to set out the emergency powers on uh, Tuesday and publish the bill on Thursday. I've been talking to uh, John Ashworth, the, the Shadow Health Secretary, who thinks on the programme shortly uh, about what's in them. This is a, a cross-party approach. He's made some suggestions of other things that should be in there, which we've included. Um, and um, we, we, it, in, it includes a whole a broad range of, uh, of actions, um, all about preparing Britain and making sure that we're uh, that we're ready should we need to be. Is the government going to be banning gatherings of over 500 people? Well, clearly, as we set out in the action plan two weeks ago, we are absolutely ready to do that um, as necessary. Um, and um, there's, so a, there's a whole host of further steps. Well, we'll uh, we've got a COBRA meeting tomorrow. Uh, we will take these decisions at the right time, but I'm absolutely prepared to take actions like that if that's what's necessary. We've already seen many uh, sporting events, for instance, uh, being cancelled um, and, um, and, and lots of these uh, big gatherings being, uh, being cancelled. The thing that really matters in terms of slowing the spread, the biggest things are, are washing your hands. If you're ill at all, cough or high temperature then you should stay at home for seven days that is absolutely critical uh, and then the the next steps like the sort of uh, the isolation for uh, for vulnerable people and older people that we talked about at the start these are the really big things that uh, that slow the spread and save the lives um, and, um, and 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 things like uh, the the mass gatherings actually you know it it doesn't really matter how big the gathering is uh, what matters is making sure that people who have the illness aren't spreading it and stay home. Um, another thing that many people are worried about is the provision of food. You know, we've all seen those empty supermarket shelves where the pasta's yeah. gone, the loo yeah. rolls gone, we've seen delays to online shopping. Um, retailers have written yeah. an open letter basically saying that buying more than is needed can sometimes mean others will be left without. I mean, this is quite alarming. Yes. Uh, are you worried that the food supply might be at risk? Um, no. So one of the things that we are confident about is that the the food supply uh, will continue. Now, of Can course, you guarantee that? Uh, well, that is that it, we're confident about it. What I what I can uh, guarantee is that we'll work with the supermarkets to make sure that the people get enough. Um, and that, you know, the, the I understand why people might be um, why, might be stocking up. But it is people have got to behave responsibly. Uh, I is think the selfish? supermarkets are right to. Um, well, I think the supermarkets are right to write the letter calling on people to be, to be responsible and to consider the impact that their stocking up might have on others. Um, and uh, we, of course, stand ready to take further measures if that's necessary. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about the government's response uh, to this, because lots of our viewers will be seeing schools closing in Ireland, they'll be seeing shops and pubs closing in France, they'll be seeing the US imposing travel bans, and we're not doing this. And they'll be thinking, why is the UK government so sure that we're right here and all the other countries are wrong? 
Well, each country is taking measures according to their own circumstances. Uh, we're similar to many countries. Uh, for instance, we're very similar to the approach being taken in Germany uh, and, uh, we're, and Australia and others. It, it's about making sure you do the right thing at the right time. We're prepared to take, if we need to, all the sorts of measures that you discuss, but we will do it based on the science. Um, and uh, of course, there's a lively debate about what's the best course of action. Um, and the, the scientific evidence is absolutely critical in underpinning our response. You know, we want to have the very best response in the world. Thankfully, so far, we have managed to keep the growth of this virus here slower than in other European countries. But we will absolutely take the measures that we, that, that we think are needed at the right time based on the best scientific advice. You say that it's based on the same on the best scientific advice. So why don't you transparently publish that advice and the government's modelling? Because at the minute we don't know how many people uh, are in hospital or in critical care. We don't know uh, the information about how many people are picking up the virus in the UK rather than abroad. We don't fully understand the science uh, behind your approach. We've been talking about herd immunity for a week, and today you say that's not part of the strategy. If you're so convinced that this is following the science. Why don't you publish it so that people can take it uh, on their own knowledge rather than just on trust? Uh, yes, we're going to do that in the, in the coming days. I think that's really important. I agree with you. Um, the, the overall So why hasn't it happened yet already? Plan, well, because our scientists are extremely busy and we're, um, and we're working incredibly hard. So, but we'll do that in the, next, uh, in the next couple of days. The overall plan is based on the science and based on transparency. Again, our response is one of the most transparent in the world. We published the plan right at the start to explain the sorts of actions we might have to take. And I remember when we published it and when I talked about it on this programme, there was quite a lot of surprise at, at saying we could do these measures, but we won't do them now. In terms of the number of people affected, um, we are, as we are uh, fully transparent about that. And in fact, now have a, a website where you can interrogate all of that data because the best science is done in the open so that people can challenge and, uh, and ask questions and make suggestions. You know, I'd rather have a hundred suggestions, even if only one of them is something new that we, that we hadn't uh, thought of. The, the, the goal here is to get the very best response for the UK. Uh, and um, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the challenge and the debate in public I think is a good thing to try to get the very best response. After all, this is something that the whole country needs to, needs to do because the whole country uh, is going to have to go through this. And it is uh, being up for debate now. Uh, your approach is being challenged. We've had this letter from hundreds of scientists claiming the government is risking many more lives than necessary by not implementing immediate social distancing measures. Richard Horton, the editor of The Lancet, uh, for example, the medical uh, journal, saying the UK government, Matt Hancock and Boris Johnson claim they are following the science, but that is not true. The evidence is clear. We need urgent implementation of social distancing and closure policies. The government is playing roulette with the pub pub public. This is a major error. Are you playing roulette? Uh, uh, no, obviously. And you know, you've got. Uh, I'm not going to go into responding to that that particular accusation. What we'll do is listen to all of the credible scientists, and we'll look at all of the evidence, and we'll listen to also all of the uh, all the politicians who are making points about the judgments that you. That, that we make, but what we will not do is deviate from having a plan that is based on the very best scientific advice, uh, and um, and that's important. I, I saw the letter. The letter was uh, uh, saying that a, a goal of uh, of herd immunity is is the wrong thing to do. Um, herd immunity is not our is is not a our goal or policy, it's a scientific concept. Our policy is to protect lives and to beat this virus. OK, Matthew Hancock, thank you very much for coming on the programme uh, today, explaining the government's response to coronavirus. Much appreciated. Good to be with you. Matt Hancock there, the Health Secretary. Well, up until now, uh, the opposition has been relatively supportive of the government's actions on coronavirus. Is that about to change? Well, listening in to that interview was Labour's Shadow Health Secretary, Jonathan Ashworth, uh, who joins us now uh, from Leicester. Thank you very much for being on the programme. Uh,
We've just heard from Matt Hancock, who says the government is going to be looking at bringing in emergency powers next week, that he's been working with you on some suggestions. What kind of thing can we expect to see? Well, can I just say at the outset that we support the national effort to deal with, to, to contain and delay the spread of this virus. People are concerned, people are worried, people are worried about what to do for, for their elderly relatives, how to keep their loved ones safe and we think it would be entirely irresponsible of us as an opposition to make this a sort of party political thing but equally it would not be responsible of us not to voice the concerns that are being voiced more widely in the scientific community not to probe the government not to ask questions we do that not to undermine the government because we want the government's strategy to succeed but we think it's important that we can all reassure ourselves that the government is taking the correct approach let me just give you one quick example the World Health Organization is saying that we should continue testing and, con and uh, contact tracing. They're saying that is the best way to break the chain of uh, contagion. The UK government have taken a different view that if you feel ill that you just stay at home for seven days and won't be tested. Many people are saying to me that they need a COVID-19 test if they're ill because they need to know whether they should be interacting with other people in a few weeks' time. I mean, I mean, if you've got elderly relatives and you take seven days off work now because you've got a cough, what happens in a month's time if you've got a cough again? Do you take another seven days off work? People need, need certainty. So I just need to understand better why the government is taking a different approach based on its science from other countries. And I think that's why it's so important that all the scientific modelling, for example, is published. We called for that last week. The government have, have said they are going to publish it because we have to take the public with us on this. And on that, more broadly, it is utterly unacceptable for government sources, whatever, to be briefing journalists overnight on issues which are very, very fundamental to how we deal with this virus, very fundamental to how our society is going to operate in the coming weeks. If things have changed since Thursday and things are changing quickly, if things have changed since the Prime Minister's press conference on Thursday, then really the Prime Minister should be doing another press conference today and explaining why things have changed. You mentioned there about how the government seems to be uh, taking different action to some of what we're seeing in other countries on, for example, school closures, travel plans, um, non-essential businesses such as pubs and restaurants staying open. Do you think we should be doing more uh, in terms of closing down uh, these kind of uh, institutions? Well, I think we need to understand better why we seem to be taking a slightly different approach to some of our uh, comparative countries and nations internationally. People are asking us why we are not taking these more far-reaching, stringent measures. People in the science community are asking that. The issue is that it's not for me to adjudicate on the science and come down in, in favour of one set of scientists or another, but I think it's important that when people are raising concerns that the government uh, modelling is, is published and it can be scrutinised and they have a clear explanation. So that's on the science. More broadly, though, I do have more broader concerns about the gov government's preparations generally. We know that this, that this virus is going to be really a real problem for the elderly and the vulnerable in society. It's going to be a real problem for the poorest in society. We want to make sure that our NHS has got the resources it needs, that our social care services have the resources that it needs, that those who need to take time off work have proper sick pay and are not finan financially penalised for taking time off work, that, that, that our elderly who are, who, are, who are being told to isolate potentially for three or four months are going to get the support that they need in the wider community because that's going to have huge social implications. These are the questions that we really want to put to the government and we need reassurances is that the government have a resourced plan and a considered plan that can maintain public confidence. Talking about resources, uh, in the interview with Matt Hancock, he was saying that the uh, provision of ventilators is effectively the priority now. Uh, they've only got 5,000, they need many times more that. If you produce the ventilator, we will buy it. No number is too high. Some people listening to that will be quite worried that we don't have enough ventilators. Is the NHS prepared? Well, the NHS needs more resources desperately. I mean, we have stories of clinicians on the front line treating uh, COVID-19 patients who don't have adequate protective uh, uh, masks and goggles and, and clothing and so on. 
we're taught we know we don't have enough beds in the NHS we certainly don't have enough intensive care beds we need to understand whether the government is able to scale up the intensive care bed capacity to levels that we hope levels that many are suggesting that we would need we've been raising some, for some time now the point about ventilators and we need to buy up those ventilators we should have been doing that weeks ago but of course ventilators need staff to operate them so we need to understand how staffing will be changing in the NHS and look, <laughs> Many, many NHS staff are getting in touch with me privately because they are desperately concerned. They're hearing reports from other health workers in Italy. Uh, they're seeing what's happening in Italy where the health service look, looks like it is under intense strain, if not becoming overwhelmed. And many NHS staff are looking for urgent reassurance that we won't be in that position. I mean, in Italy is a G7 country and they've got international aid, aid, uh, aid, aid bodies like MSF going in to help their efforts on the front line. I mean, NHS staff are raising these issues with me directly, and I think ministers urgently, urgently need to reassure us that they have a resourcing plan in place to support our NHS staff who are on the front line in this, uh, in, in, in this battle with coronavirus. Um, I just want to go back to the very first question that I, I asked you. Um, Matt Hancock saying the government will be seeking emergency... Oh, sorry, I didn't answer, sorry. <laughs> ...in Parliament next week. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure you do answer this one before you go. Um, sorry. You've been working with the House Secretary on these emergency powers. What kind of thing uh, could we see? Well, we, uh, we, of course we want to cooperate because this is not a party political issue, but we'll, we'll, we will be uh, voicing our concerns, uh, we will be uh, asking the government to reassure us that, the, that some of the very stringent powers they're hoping to put on the statute book what emergency will only, specifically only be used. are under consideration? Well, I mean, uh, well, I mean the, the things that you've seen in the newspapers are, are, are the things that they're talking about. I mean, powers Such over as. quarantine, powers over what but uh, we, actually, some of the quarantine powers are already on the statute book because we had to we had to amend the regulations uh, uh, last week. And, but what we're really concerned about is issues like sick pay. People are who people who are low paid and who need to take time off work should not okay. be penalised for it because they'll be asked to make a choice between financial hardship and their health, and that is not acceptable. Okay, and then just finally, while we've got you. Um Lots of people are very worried about food supply. They'll be going into their local Asda, Tesco, Sainsbury's, Waitrose, seeing empty shelves, uh, waiting for weeks for a delivery slot that they can book. Um, are people selfish who are stockpiling some of these essential item items? I don't, I don't... Well, uh, I, I, no, I don't think that. People are, people are worried. And, the, and I think the, the broader issue point is this. We really need a mass coordinated effort. I mean, I was very uh, fortunate in many ways that I, I got the, I worked in Downing Street for Gordon Brown at the time of the financial crash. Gordon Brown gripped that issue and led an international effort on it. We need another big coordinated international effort on this because certainty is everything. People need advice. And this virus spreads quickly and it exploits ambivalence. We don't want any ambiguity. People just want clear advice, not briefings to journalists overnight. The Prime Minister should be out there daily telling, speaking to the nation and explaining why things are changing. I appreciate this is fast moving, but that what we've seen with the panic buying is a reflection of the uncertainty is, that is out there, which is why I would really urge the Prime Minister to be more on the front foot. I'm not trying to be sort of, uh, you know, scoring points for the sake of it. But people want that certainty and they want to be reassured that government has a grip. That was the big lesson we learned when we were in government and Gordon Brown responded to the financial crash in 2008. Thank you very much, Jonathan Ashworth, there, uh, laying out Labour's uh, side of the story. Well, uh, in the midst of this crisis, experts are certainly back in vogue and the government has put scientists at the centre of its response to coronavirus. Sir Mark Walport is the former chief scientific advisor and in his new role at UK Research and Innovation, he's leading the charge to find a vaccine to the virus. Thank you very much for being with us. Morning. Much appreciated. So just on the vaccine, how far away realistically are we? Well, Vaccines are being developed at a very fast rate, and so there are a number of candidates, uh, big companies, small companies, universities are all working. The challenge here is to make sure that the vaccine is safe and that it works, and unfortunately that takes a period of time to do. So realistically, it's very unlikely that we're going to have a vaccine for the present round of this epidemic. Um, you say it takes time. I mean, are we talking months, we're, we're talking we're, we're talking months, but uh, so, you know, up to a year. Yeah, up to a year. Thank you. Um, 
in that case, obviously, knowing how quickly this spreads, are most of us going to get coronavirus? Um, over time, it's quite likely that a large percentage of populations around the world will get it, most of them very mildly indeed, and many indeed subclinically. Mm -hmm. And if you like, the scientific information that's needed at the moment is firstly, how do we most effectively reduce the transmission of the disease, because that's the best way of controlling it and enabling new treatments and vaccines to be developed. That's the first thing. The second thing, we need to understand the virus and its effects to develop new treatments. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, thirdly, we need to keep society functioning. Mm -hmm. um, and so the scientific advice to government is in all three of those areas. And there are trade-offs, as you've heard. So if we want to look after vulnerable elderly people, they need people to come and look after them. If we need the shops to keep going, then we need them to be supplied. Modern society is a very complex system and we need people to be able to work. Can you explain a bit of the science behind the government's approach? Because people will be looking at what different countries are doing around the world and they won't understand why it is, for example, that in Ireland schools are shutting, but schools and nurseries are being kept open in here. In France and Italy, they're closing bars and restaurants and we're not doing the same. Okay, well, I mean, the first principle is how do you reduce transmission in the most effective way? Um, and that is about uh, social distancing. But the goal here is also to look after the vulnerable who do need care and also try and protect the NHS from being overwhelmed. And so the idea is, is sometimes described as flattening the curve. So if you have a very steep peak, then it means that systems potentially become overwhelmed. If by distancing you can slow it down, that's the best thing to do. Mm -hmm. Now, already uh, the scientific advice um, is to, if you have an infection or if you, ha if you have symptoms, to self-isolate. So people who have uh, fever, who have muscle aches, who have dry cough, stay at home. Um, and that's one way of reducing the spread of infection. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, you can go to a very extreme model of this and try and shut everything down, mm. but then society does stop working. We can have a quick look, actually. I think we've, we've got a, a bit of a graphic just to try and mm. illustrate some of this, uh, to show you what different countries are doing. You can see there lots of sporting events shut in the UK, the self-isolation, as you were talking about. Mm. Then if you compare it to, say, Italy and China, they've got ticks all the way along. I mean, do, do you think we are going to see, as the months and weeks increase, more, for example, school closures um, in the UK? I, mean, I, I think the answer is that, of, of course, as um, uh, the epidemic does potentially gather pace, then there will be more limitations on people's movement. Schools is an interesting problem, actually. It's, um, at the moment, it's clear that young people show very few signs of infection. But they could spread But it. they are still getting infected, there's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But it's not clear, actually, whether the young are getting their infections from the older or the older are getting their infections from the young, and that's one of the important research questions. Mm. Um, it looks, uh, speaking to Matt Hancock, it's pretty clear that perhaps the next stage of the UK government's response is what you were referring to as effectively shielding. So asking yeah. those most at-risk groups, over 70s, perhaps those with underlying health issues, to self-isolate. How important is that? Well, uh, the answer is it will be important, but these things can't be done in an absolute sense because Elderly people have to have supplies of food, they have to have the necessary care. And so it's not going to be possible to completely uh, shield people Should from... Should people start country. doing it now? I mean, it, w w lots of people be watching this thinking, I'm over the age of 70, or, or my mum or my dad is. W what's your advice? Well, I mean, my job is actually to provide the, the scientific mm -hmm. advice mm -hmm. through funding the research. So um, uh, in my previous job, I was doing the mm -hmm. job that Patrick Vannes is mm -hmm. now doing, and course he's working closely with uh, Chris Whitty who's the CMO. Um, so my job is really to provide the evidence. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the advice, I mean I think it's it's very difficult to give general advice. Mm -hmm. It depends on the individual situation. It's a judgment uh, many, call. It is a judgment call and all of this is judgment calls. And one thing I would say is that the UK has the most deeply embedded system of scientific advice in emergencies I think of any country in the world. And so the UK was prepared to provide good scientific advice to government, unlike, I'm afraid, a number of other countries. Um, the, uh, on the National Risk Register, pandemic infection has been the top risk for many years. You mentioned other countries there. Do you think some of this has been driven by politics rather than science? Well, inevitably, there are judgments about this. So, for example, actually, a large outdoor gathering 
there are, of course, risks, but there are also risks from 50 people in a, a, closed, in a closed environment if one of them is infected. So all of these things are a judgment. It's about how you do keep society going in the most effective way possible. There's been lots of talk about herd immunity. Yes. Where effectively 60% or more of the population get infected and then become immune to try and limit the spread of the virus. We've been told it's not the government policy, but... Is no, it, I, I, think, I think it really isn't the government policy. And I think this has become... Uh, the, the narrative has become a bit confused about oh. this, to be perfectly honest. The, what's going on is that the primary concern is to save lives. It is about protecting the most vulnerable and it's relieving pressure on the NHS. Now, it is perfectly true over time, as more people become infected and immune as a result, then they can no longer spread the infection. Um, and of course, the way that vaccines work ultimately is by giving herd immunity. In other words, what happens is when a large percentage of the population is immune to a condition, and it is typically through vaccination, then the transmission reduces. Mm. But I think that this is not the narrative, actually. The, 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 there's, there's, that is not the policy mm. of the government. The policy is, as I say, to reduce the transmission and save lives. You were, you were very keen, of course, to emphasise the science that the government's working yeah. on. What I can't work out is why isn't the government publishing all um, of this evidence? I mean, the short answer is that I think that they are about to publish all the evidence on which the modelling is based. It would have been reassuring for many people to have it from the start, though, wouldn't I, it? I think that's true, but uh, I think one has to recognise that, if you like, in the heat of battle, uh, what the researchers are really working on is analysing a flood of information that's coming in very fast indeed. Um, and so there are at least two independent groups of modellers, disease, infectious disease modellers, that are advising the government. They're working very hard on data that is emerging on a day-by-day -day basis, but the government have um, agreed that this should be published, which I think is absolutely right. Should it been, have been done earlier, in your view? Um, the retrospectoscope is an infinitely powerful instrument. <laughs> and, and at the end of the day, people will look back on this and work out what was right and, and what wasn't. Um, it's worth saying that we are also, um, in UK Research Innovation, working very hard to create a, a lay source of the scientific information that people can go to if they want to find out about a bit more of the details about the science, what the virus is, how it transmits, what potential new therapies are, and we'll be getting that online sometime in the next week. Um, I'm interested as well to know about what you think the trajectory is, what, what is going to happen in the weeks ahead. Lots of people will be feeling it's almost like the calm before the storm. Um, I mean, how far away is Italy from the peak? Um, I mean, the short answer is it's always easier to predict the past than the future. But uh, the answer is that this is a spreading infection. It will continue to spread. There will be more cases so, in the UK and around the world. So even in Italy, there's still some distance away from the peak? Um, I think that's right. Um, and, uh, and the other thing to say is that if you isolate everyone, uh, then it's, it's a bit like putting out a fire. If you deprive it from oxygen, then the flames will go down. But if you have any embers left in that fire, the second the oxygen comes back, you'll get an outbreak again. And so it's this balance between trying to smooth it or dampening it down with the risk then that it will come back. Um, but, but the answer is that this uh, infection has a long way to go around the world yet. Um, there's an awful lot we don't know about it. Um, and that's why research is so important. And we and others, the government's committed already over £75 million specifically for research in the last few weeks. Um, and the other thing to say is that we are prepared in the sense that the Medical Research Council, which is part of UK Research Innovation, has a Centre for Global Infectious Disease Analysis, which has been going for years. And the, 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 the modellers who advised here were very helpful around Ebola, and Zika when I was the government's chief scientific advisor. So these aren't being plucked from thin air. Uh, there's a center for virus research in the University of Glasgow. In Oxford, there's a human immunology unit which is working on vaccines. And so our research system, and if anyone wants a justification for why fundamental research matters, this is it. it's, this, <laughs> it's this, where we actually understand uh, viruses. Mm. Uh, this is the first time ever in history that within a few weeks of a, a new virus coming out, the sequence, the whole sequence of the virus was made available mm. and so the some, Chinese released that. Some things to be 
optimistic about, despite the... the uh, yes, I mean, I mean, you don't have to go very many years ago and we'll, we'd still be struggling to work out what this virus was. Realistically, and in some ways these questions are always difficult because you don't want to sound alarmist, but I think people do want to know the scale of the, the problem that we're talking about. How many deaths are we talking about potentially? I, I, is, is, it, is, that, is that too difficult to answer? I think it's too difficult it? to answer yeah. specifically. Uh, because uh, one of the other important things to, do, to know is that we don't know how many cases are completely asymptomatic. Yes. And there is an important reason for that, because there are tests of two sorts. So the test that's being used at the moment is a test to identify the virus uh, genome. Mm -hmm. And so that will detect active infection where there's virus present in swabs, for example. Okay. And very briefly, um, it, will this always be with us, like seasonal flu? Um, I think it's very difficult to answer that. I mean, coronaviruses have been around. And uh, in fact, there, is, there are about seven coronaviruses that infect humans. Uh, the early ones, actually, that were discovered basically cause cold, cold like in, um, uh, illnesses. But then we've had SARS, uh, which was in 2003. Uh, we've had, uh, we have at the moment a, a, a virus called MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, uh, which is a very nasty virus, and that came out in 2012. And now we've got this one. OK, thank you so much for coming on uh, and explaining some of the, the science behind uh, what we're seeing happen. Much appreciated. Thank, thank you. you. Well, many of us are wondering how we would actually cope uh, if we were forced to uh, self-isolate for a period of months. I seem to have bought myself a PlayStation over the last couple of days in preparation. So let's find out what it's actually really like. Uh, the SNP's Lisa Cameron has been self-isolating with symptoms of the virus. So she joins us from her home. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for being on the programme. How are you feeling? Thank you. Um... I'm still feeling really very tired, sort of exhaustion has been uh, the largest symptom for me. Um, I've got a, a dry cough, um, not, not a phlegmy cough that, that you would normally have with a cold, uh, so it's a sort of irritable cough. I've got aches and pains round, round my back, mainly in my shoulders. Um, sleeping a lot and um, I've had swollen glands over the past few days as well but, but that's sort of dissipating a bit now. Given so, all that so, we yeah. do appreciate uh, you talking to us certainly um, and hope you feel mm -hmm. a lot better soon. Um, there's no testing for people in your situation is that right? Well, that changed um, last week. I, I mean, I was on the, the phone to 111 a number of times as uh, symptoms developed. And at first I was told um, that my symptoms weren't concerning just to carry on as usual. Um, then on uh, Thursday night, when I called again with my cough had developed at that point in time, uh, the doctor that I spoke to at that point referred me for testing. So I was expecting to have a test. Then um, the next day I had a call from um, the NHS in the afternoon and they said that the strategy had, had sort of changed and that there was no testing um, after uh, that day. So I wasn't going to be referred for a test. So um, I suppose on the one hand, you, you do want to have a test, you want to know um, a diagnosis. But on the other, I, I, I think perhaps it may be that they have to keep the test for people who are much more vulnerable. So you don't want to take a test from someone else who's you know much more critical than yourself <coughs> it's, yeah. it's definitely that balance as you say i think isn't it to try and relieve the pressure but also make sure you feel supported i mean do you feel that you've had the support that you need from the service I, th I think this, the service has been absolutely inundated. I know when I when I called back on Thursday evening, I waited about three hours um, for a response, but it was because they were they were totally inundated. So I, I think the service is probably at capacity, and and people are working absolutely round the clock. So I can't fault I can't fault that at all. That they're doing an amazing job in in this situation. Um, I think it's difficult because the, the strategy and the messaging appears to have sort of changed um, for people who, who have this, the symptoms from, um, you know, at first it was a, a sort of keep calm, carry on. There, there wasn't, you know, anything to worry about, just go on as normal. And then um, as things progressed um, and actually as, as my cough developed, then then that was tot totally different on, on the Thursday evening, so, which is understandable as symptoms develop, but you you feel a bit in the dark with it. Um, you don't know how long to expect the symptoms for. Um, I've not, not had anything since being called um, 
on the Friday to, to say that I, I shouldn't be getting testing anymore. Um, at that point, I was told that my husband um, and children could carry on as normal, but we sort of just decided ourselves that, that they would um, self-isolate as well because um, of, you know, the public interaction. We didn't want to be putting people at risk and, and we weren't really sure of um, how infectious it is and, and, and whether or not I had already passed it on to them. So we didn't want to take that risk with other people's health. I'm interested to know a little bit about the reality of being self-isolated. I mean, you just mentioned that your children have been self-isolated too. I think it's, for many parents, that's something that they would be worried about. How would that work practically? Is it boring? Are you watching loads of box sets? Are you, you know, learning a new language? What are you doing? <laughs> it's really, really difficult. Um, I, I've been trying to, as much as possible, stay in a different room from them. Occasionally, they burst into the room, and I have to remind them, no, you can't, you can't come in here. It's really difficult. You want, you want to hug your children. You want, you want to be with them, um, but for their safety and, and their health, then you're, you're pretty much keeping away from them. I've been told to um, use a, a different bathroom um, where possible. We're lucky I've got a downstairs bathroom. I can, I can do that. Other families wouldn't necessarily be able to do that. Um, my husband's um, basically being mum and dad um, just now and, and just trying to make sure that, that we keep separate. Uh, so it, it's very difficult. I'm speaking to Alexa a lot now in my room <laughs> on my own. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Everyone should <laughs> talking to Alexa. I can totally see that as, as a way of trying to keep up the uh, interaction. And then just finally, we've, we've seen lots of stories about people struggling to get hold of essential items at supermarkets, um, delays to deliveries and so on. Um, is that something that concerns you as someone who actually is in self-isolation? Yeah, I, well, I, I've made an, an order to the supermarket, but there, there's, I mean, I think they're absolutely inundated as well. So that doesn't come until Wednesday. Um, and uh, there's special um, precautions that you had to put on it to let, the, obviously, the driver and the delivery staff know um, your predicament. Um, so we, we've done all of that. Um, and, but we've got a very good neighbour who's left some things, milk and, and actually a bunch of flowers as well, and, and, and some sort of daily things on the doorstep each day. So um, much gratitude to them. Uh, That's very but, nice. You know, that, <laughs> It's, it's, really, it's really nice and thoughtful because I think the supermarkets, I, I, I don't know, I think it's gone from a let's be calm and carry on to there's a bit of panic now and people are really concerned. So I think the supermarkets are, are being very inundated. You can't get a delivery for a number of days is, is what I find. I, I'm more concerned for, you know, elderly people who might be on their own. How would they, how would they get they get supplies, that kind of thing. So, I mean, I think for people who don't have any symptoms, who don't have the virus, if, if older adults are, are isolating, then maybe we have to be thinking about do they need do they need some help at this point too, um, and, and, and being much more community and neighbourly focused. Yeah, definitely Obviously, good. a bit of advice. <laughs> Yeah, but I hope, I, hope, I hope to be back, back soon within the next um, couple of weeks anyway and, and get back to normal and to, to be able to help people. I mean, that's the thing with the test, I would say. If you had the test, you you would know whether you'd had it and, and the period was finished. I could, I could go back to work and then symptoms develop again and I think, well, I've had this. Uh, you yeah. know, so it's a bit confusing. You, you, you're not quite sure, but I think you just have to take it a day at a time and, and, and see it through oh. and just check okay. and get it every stage thank you thank you um thank you so much for coming on the program especially when you're not feeling well i hope you feel better very soon and good luck uh, keeping the kids at bay as well thank you well, prisons uh, have become one of the flashpoints of the virus, with riots breaking out in Italy and thousands of inmates being freed in Iran. The Prison Officers Association has thousands of members across the UK's prison system, and their General Secretary, Steve Gillen, joins us now. Thank you so much for being uh, with us uh, today. How worried are you about what coronavirus could mean for our prisons? Well, this is unprecedented, and it's not just for our prisoners, it's for the staff, mm. uh, our brave uh, workforce, PRA members, that work in uh, prisons up and down the country and indeed in the NHS setting. Uh, I've been around the criminal justice system now for 30 years and this is one of the most critical issues uh, going. And I'm pleased to say that uh, we're working uh, 
constructively with government uh, and with employer. Uh, I've had meetings with the Director General, Phil Koppel, uh, and I spoke to him on the phone yesterday, and we've been updated as regular as mm -hmm. can be, because it's a moving situation. And of course, by the nature of prisons, you have a large number of people in relatively close proximity to each other. Iran has freed tens of thousands of prisoners because of this fear of coronavirus spreading through uh, our prisons. Is that the kind of thing that's in the contingency plans in the UK? Well, not as yet, uh, but previous governments have mm -hmm. uh, done what is called an executive release of mm -hmm. prisoners. Mm -hmm. uh, that may come in the future to free up spaces in prisons. And what does it mean? Does that mean like a temporary release where they're monitored and then brought or brought back in later? It could mean that, or that the Secretary of State has the powers uh, to look at low-risk category prisoners uh, and just release them as that executive release. Towards now, the end of their sentence, for it, example? It could well be. So, for example, at the moment, in the open estate, which is known as the Category D estate, uh, there's about 4,000 uh, prisoners in that. Now, at the moment, uh, some prisoners are being isolated who are showing signs of the virus. Mm -hmm. No one, to my knowledge, I've, as of this morning, uh, has actually been tested positive, mm. but they are being isolated in single cell accommodation. Mm. Now, we all know that prisons uh, are grossly overcrowded. Mm. Uh, that can only uh, happen for a period of time. Mm. Um, staff as well, my members, PRY members, I mean, prison officers and operational support grades and all those who work in prisons mm. uh, are sometimes wholly... Um, not recognised for the valuable work that they do. Mm -hmm. And this is an opportunity to recognise the braveness mm -hmm. of those frontline staff who themselves uh, could be put at risk. Now, I'm pleased to say that we're working hand in glove uh, with the employer and government. I've written mm -hmm. to Robert Buckland, uh, offering him a round table, mm -hmm. not just uh, with ourselves, but with the Police Federation, uh, has, also, has, he, has he replied to you yet? Well, he's not, he's not responded as yet, but I'm hoping in the coming days that he does because we've said this is an opportunity for government such as him, the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, and the Prime Minister himself to talk to us about our knowledge of the criminal justice system. I mean, a couple of things just to unpick from what you were saying there. Firstly, this idea that prisoners, obviously, I guess, if you show signs of coronavirus or other illness, will have to self-isolate and only so many single vacancy cells yeah. there. Can you see other buildings, for example, being taken over to be used to isolate people It's in? not been discussed with us as yet, but we've got more meetings coming in the coming weeks, mm -hmm. and I suppose this is a movable feast. Mm -hmm. uh, if it takes off in prisons, then... Which you it know, has elsewhere. Absolutely. Everywhere will have to be looked at. We don't want a situation like Italy. Mm -hmm. And I think communication uh, with the, the men and women prisoners and the youngsters in our care uh, is paramount. We've got to converse with them properly. Mm -hmm. We've got to converse with the families and make sure that everybody's safe. Mm -hmm. uh, because you're right, uh, other buildings could be looked at. For, so for example, in the past, when uh, the prison service has been overcrowded, uh, they've had to commandeer prison ships and mm -hmm. things like that and make them safe and so forth. So I wouldn't rule anything out at this moment in time, but, but the welfare Mm. Uh, of those in our care is paramount. The welfare mm. of staff mm. is paramount. People, we, we can't just send prisoners home to self-isolate. Um, mm. That's one of those occupations, uh, along with the NHS, yeah. like nurses. Yeah. You can't just say, go home, because they've got to be at work. So we'll be looking for investment from the government as well. But I can, I, I can talk about those things directly what? with the Secretary of State when he comes to meet me. Will you need more prison officers, potentially, then, if a large number of people are going to be at home? There is no doubt in my mind that we will need... We've well, been saying that for the last 10 years yeah. anyway, but I don't want but to in, make... In particular, with this situation yeah. that we're in. Yeah, I, I don't want to make political points out of it, but we are under-resourced. Uh, you know, I, I want a proper package put in place for prison officers, operational support grades. We might have to have a budget from government mm -hmm. that increases uh, for overtime and mm -hmm. things like that, as and when you need more money. staff fall sick, because they will. Mm -hmm. There is no doubt about that at the moment. Uh, some people are self-isolating mm -hmm. the staff. The, the figures that I got as of yesterday was in total 
113 nationally, mm. and there's some 75 prisoners in isolation at this moment, although none have been tested positive. positive as yet. And then just finally, you were talking about the welfare of prisoners as well. I mean, in Italy, we've seen riots breaking mm. out. We've seen, very sadly, some deaths because of drug overdoses. If people are being forced to stay on their own, visits are being restricted, yeah. this is going to have a big impact on a group of people, a section of the population, who already uh, may have mental health problems. Well, Sophie, you're, you're absolutely right. There's many vulnerable uh, cases uh, within prisons of mental health, as you said, of drug addiction, uh, even uh, prisoners that are aged 70 and over, uh, that's increasing. So we've got about uh, 2,000 of them in the population at the moment. Mm -hmm. Of course, nobody wants to see disturbances and riots mm -hmm. of the scale that we've seen in Italy. Uh, and that's why communication, proper screening, uh, education of both staff and prisoners mm -hmm. in relation to this is paramount. And, and it's why my union has taken uh, on board to work constructively with mm -hmm. government mm -hmm. and the employer, all employers, because we are the largest uh, trade union in the criminal justice sector and we take that very responsibly. And I'm sure uh, with the correct resources, mm -hmm. uh, things will get bad, there's, there's no doubt about that, but it's preparing prisoners, talking to them to make sure they understand why certain things have been done. And it might be done uh, separately in different establishments. I don't think there'll be a blanket mm -hmm ban on things or visits or things like that, but it could be introduced gradually depending on how severe it is at certain prisons. Uh, some big questions there uh, that need addressing. Uh, thank you very much for coming on the programme uh, and outlining uh, what the prison service is doing to prepare. Much appreciated. Thank you, Sophie. Well, the virus will inevitably, of course, uh, put the National Health Service under severe pressure. And today, the government's effectively put British industry on a war footing, as we were hearing from Matt Hancock earlier, asking them to transform their production lines in order to produce more ventilators and tackle the virus. So, is the health service prepared? Joining us now is the chair of the British Medical Association, Dr Chand Nagpal. Thank you very much for being on the programme. Uh, again, much appreciated. Uh, it's always good to get some kind of expert advice on, on the, the real situation. Um, we were talking to the health secretary earlier and he sent out this call to arms for businesses to produce more uh, ventilators. Firms can't make too many. If you make a ventilator, we will buy it. Clearly, the NHS doesn't have enough ventilators right now. Yeah, so our starting position, unfortunately, has been uh, far worse than many other of our European nations. We have about a quarter of the critical care beds uh, that Germany has, uh, as an example. So it's really critical, it's really important that we uh, now see transparently what plans the government has to expand that capacity. Uh, that will also, uh, of course, be in tandem with trying to slow down the spread of the, the infection so that we don't see a peak that overwhelms the health service. But yes, we need to see that transparency, the plans and exactly how we will uh, be able to support the demands of critical care on the health service. Why do we have so much fewer ventilators, beds than other countries. Yeah. So the, the British Medical Association has been uh, campaigning or lobbying for us to have the sort of infrastructure that many other European nations take for granted. It's, it's a result of a decade of underfunding. Uh, and now what therefore we need to do is make some really decisive decisions on how that limited resource is used in the best possible way for those uh, who, who are going to need it. Uh, and that may require, uh, uh, and it should require actually, some major decisions decisions, for example, on ceasing uh, non-urgent routine care, mm -hmm. uh, a mass move towards uh, many more consultations occurring remotely. We need to see the government implementing and enabling, for example, uh, GP surgeries to provide online consultations. It's occurring in some, but it's by no means widespread. Uh, there's no need, in my view, for patients to be going into a hospital clinic now simply to be given a test result. We need to have clear plans where how patients can be remotely managed and how the technology can support that. So do you think the whole GP system, as, a, as, as you like, needs to be looked at in the months ahead? 
Well, uh, yes, and, and the, one of the most immediate priorities, of course, is we don't have enough doctors. Uh, before the outbreak, we were 10,000 uh, doctors short. So uh, we're very, very worried, and the doctors that I represent are very concerned, that they don't, for example, have adequate uh, protection. Uh, GPs have paper masks of a low uh, 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 effectiveness. Uh, they, they're worried that when they're seeing patients in their clinics at close proximity, they might get infected, and if they do, they'll be off work. The other priority for the health service must be uh, rapid testing of doctors, because with the government's um, policy of self-isolation for seven days, uh, we may see many healthcare workers who, who may not have uh, COVID-19, who may be off for two or three days, recover, and yet still be off work because of the policy. If they could be tested, they could come back to work. And I can't emphasize how, how, how serious the problem is if you've got doctors off work. In a GP surgery with three or four doctors, if two of them are self-isolating, that could effectively prevent the practice running uh, in a normal fashion. Are you, are you effectively calling for the end of non-urgent NHS care? I think that we have to be responsible. Uh, we know that we don't have the facilities for critical care. We need to expand those facilities. Hospitals need to now start to vacate uh, uh, routine uh, facilities and, and convert them into intensive care beds uh, and so what forth. What kind of thing are we talking about? We're talking about routine operations, but also if you have an illness that you know is not coronavirus or is not potentially life-threatening, that you should just stay away effectively. Yes, I, there's two, two ways to deal with it. One, yes, we need to make some decisions around, or the government needs to make decisions around stopping mm -hmm. uh, non-urgent services so that we can target uh, our care to those that are, are, are ill and need immediate uh, attention. But also, there are different ways of providing care. As I said, we can move to far more uh, uh, technology-enabled remote management of patients using video telephone mm -hmm. uh, links. Uh, but, but also, we need to be targeting and protecting those who are the most vulnerable. Mm. So in terms of social distancing, we know that those who have got pre-existing medical conditions those older patients who would be the illest if they were to contract the virus, those are the, 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 the groups that we need to be protecting and isolating from getting uh, infected. On that, um, the Health Secretary earlier is saying that they are looking at asking the over 70s to effectively self-isolate, but not yet. Do you think that needs to happen now? I think it's, it's, it's important that we protect the at-risk groups now, absolutely. So uh, if you're over 70, well, you I would, should I, 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 look at self-isolating. I, I think it's really important that, that not just those that are over 70, those that have got respiratory illnesses and uh, those that are immunocompromised do need to be taking measures and the government needs to have a policy for, for such patients to be protected. And what kind of measures do you mean? That means not not going into crowds, not mixing with others where there may be, we know there's circulating infection, so be, by isolating you are reducing the risk of contracting the virus. The, the other thing I also must mention, because the, the British Medical Association represents retired doctors, mm -hmm. uh, many of them are asking questions mm -hmm. about how they can uh, perhaps support the medical workforce. Uh, after the announcement two weeks ago, we've received no details. Uh, it's really important that we see exactly what is planned to to enable us to have the doctor and workforce capacity to deal with this. Are you confident in the government approach? I, I, I think that, that we need information now. Uh, I don't think, uh, you know, we've got that information. Uh, and as I said earlier, it, you, you can't just get doctors to return back to work instantly. We need to understand how they'll be registered, how they'll be trained, exactly what they'll be doing, especially for many retired doctors mm -hmm. who could also be in a risk group. They can provide care, but in a remote fashion, not patient facing. So we really need those answers, plans now. Just finally, we spoke a couple of weeks ago. Mm. You were sitting in the same place. Um, I feel that you seem much more worried now, your, your manner, your demeanor, is that fair? Of course I'm worried. I mean, I said two weeks ago that this situation could change on a daily basis. Uh, and in fact, that is exactly what has happened. Uh, we are in a very different place compared to two weeks ago, when in fact, when we met, we had about 20 odd cases. Mm. Uh, that is why I don't think we have the luxury of time anymore. Uh, we need to have clear, decisive plans. We need to have a very targeted approach. Uh, as I said, I represent doctors. They need to be kept healthy. They need to be protected because if we have any reduction in our workforce, we won't be able to provide the care patients need. Are you seeing those clear, decisive plans? 
As I said, I think we need them now. I, 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 we have concerns no. that we don't have all of those answers at the moment. We need them. OK, thank you so much for being on the show and putting your uh, viewpoint across. Much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, well, that is it uh, for this week. Lots, of course, uh, on uh, coronavirus on the programme today. Uh, in a moment, we'll be discussing everything we've just heard with our political correspondent, Nick Martin, in Sophie Ridge, The Take. And, of course, stay with Sky News throughout the day for all the very latest as governments around the world react to this developing crisis. Welcome to Sophie Ridge, The Take, where we have a look back at the key moments from the show. Today, of course, it was dominated by the efforts to tackle the coronavirus uh, pandemic. We were really trying to get answers to some of the questions that we know many of you uh, will be uh, asking from the people at the centre of the government response and also some of the independent experts who can tell us about the situation on the ground and the science that is leading uh, the political response to. Uh, first up on the show was the man who's at the centre of this crisis, the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock. And I was keen to ask him about reports that we've seen recently that people over the age of 70, those at high risk uh, of coronavirus, could be asked to self-isolate for up to four months as part of a so-called shielding process. Let's have a listen to our exchange on that. We set out in the plan how we would be prepared to do that and to advise the elderly and the vulnerable who are most at risk from this virus uh, to, uh, to protect themselves, to shield themselves by self-isolating. And um, we'll be setting out um, when that's necessary. We don't want to do that too soon because if we do, uh, it, it's clearly you know, not an easy thing for people to do. It's not an easy thing for people to sustain. But the critical thing is we need to be ready and we, everybody as a community needs to be ready to support the people who are being shielded for their own protection, uh, the elderly and the vulnerable. I'm keen to talk more about this shielding um, because there'll be lots of people watching who'll be wanting to know exactly what this means in practice. So there are reports that the government is going to be asking people over the age of 70 to self-isolate, to stay at home for up to four months. Is that right? Well, the answer to that is not yet. And the reason that we are not saying that yet is just because of this length of time uh, that people would have to take that action to protect themselves. But is themselves, it going to happen at some point? Uh, is, is very long. Um, it, that is in the plan, yes. It's clearly in the action plan. The thing that we're saying today is that we need a national effort also to help prepare the NHS. So we've been working to buy as many ventilators as we can because that's one of the critical things that's needed for people who are ill. I'm and keen to talk about that in a moment. today the Prime Minister is... I'm keen to talk about right. that in a moment, just, but just to be crystal clear on the elderly, the government will be asking the over 70s to self-isolate, potentially for a period of months, at some point in the future. Uh, that is in the action plan, yes, and we'll be setting it out uh, with more detail when that's the right, it, it's the right time to do so, uh, because we absolutely appreciate that it is, uh, that is a very big uh, ask of, uh, of the elderly and the vulnerable, and it's for their own self-protection. Are we talking about days, weeks away? How, how long are we talking? Well, certainly in the, in the coming weeks, absolutely. House Secretary uh, Matt Hancock there. Uh, lots of reports uh, over the last day or so about whether or not the over 70s could be asked to self-isolate. The House Secretary is saying there that effectively that will happen, but not yet. Uh, Anne Gripper, uh, the executive editor of Mirror uh, Online, has been tweeting about this story. Uh, Matt Hancock has just confirmed the over 70s self-isolating for months is in the plan, but not yet. Why do they keep telling us about what will come next? It just leaves everyone wondering when and why not now? Uh, lots of questions, lots of reaction to this uh, on Twitter, because clearly uh, asking people to stay at home for months is a big ask, as the Health Secretary said, uh, and confusion potentially uh, about whether or not uh, it should happen imminently or not. Uh, we can talk to our political correspondent, uh, Nick Martin, who's been listening across to that uh, interview. Uh, confirmation there from Matt Hancock that this shielding process, effectively trying to ask those most vulnerable to self-isolate, is on the cards. 
Yes, and this tactic, Sophie, of drip feeding information, uh, I think is designed to not, is to regulate panic, but I think the, the side effect of it is to naturally increase confusion amongst people. I was speaking to quite a few elderly people last week who just didn't know how things would impact on them. And Matt Hancock today is saying, yes, it, it is in the plan for over 70s to self-isolate for months. I mean, think about it, several months in the house is coming down the road, but we will advise as and when. Isn't, I don't think, helping many people who are sitting at home watching this wondering, well, I'm over 70, how will it impact on me? Now, some of the concrete things that we'll expect the government to come out with next week are some publishing of emergency measures, which may include more information on self-isolating the vulnerable and the elderly. Are we going to he, he, told you, he told you earlier, didn't he, that emergency measures would be revealed on Tuesday and published on Wednesday. And that, of course, might encapsulate all these things about mass gatherings and including isolating the elderly. But extremely difficult for people sitting at home to try and sort the wheat from the chaff here. How long will they have to self-isolate for? And when will the government officially give them that advice that that's what they'll have to do? So I think the government are trying to measure the panic, but they're causing confusion at the same time. Uh, Nick Martin, thank you for uh, that analysis. It's a difficult balancing act for uh, the government, uh, talking to one of their advisers uh, a little bit uh, earlier on the programme, trying to say that it's a big ask, we need people to do it at the right time. It's where does the human behaviour, I guess, the trade-offs hit up with the science uh, advice as well. Um, we're going to have a break now. Uh, lots more to come uh, on Sophie Ridge, uh, the take where we'll be discussing uh, the government response and uh, some of the expert takes on coronavirus. Welcome back to Sophie Ridge The Take, where we're having a look back at a show which was today dominated by the efforts to tackle the coronavirus uh, pandemic. First, of course, uh, Italy is currently the worst affected country uh, in Europe, really uh, at the centre uh, of the outbreak at the minute, with part of the country uh, in shutdown uh, as well. And at the minute, we can now go to central London, uh, where we can speak to the Italian ambassador to uh, the United Kingdom, Raphael Trombetta. Thank you so much for being uh, with us. Uh, we've all seen those images of the health service in Italy, which looks overwhelmed. What is the situation? Well, the situation uh, yesterday, the um, data, the statistics were released. Uh, at the moment, people who have uh, an active you know, infection are 17,750, the deceased 1,441, and those who have fully recovered 1,966. So it's still uh, uh, quite a, an heavy toll, I have to say but the country is, is coping. People are understanding you know, all the measures that the government had to take and, uh, and, then, uh, and then complying with those. The country is in effective lockdown. How difficult has it been, do you think, for uh, citizens in Italy to make such drastic changes to their daily lives? Well, it's not it's not easy for people, you know, uh, to, to, to be to be confined in their, in their home. Uh, I, I suppose, you know, uh, all your viewers uh, have seen those beautiful scenes of uh, uh, Italians uh, going to the balcony or terraces or windows and singing and playing music. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing which shows the weight, but also the resilience of the Italian people. Yeah, I think those scenes really were a kind of sprinkling of joy in a way. Uh, in the minute, not too much of that around, but some, certainly some beautiful scenes of, as you said, the resilience of people uh, in the face uh, of this crisis. Um, Italy's imposed some quite strict social distancing rules. Are you surprised that the United Kingdom hasn't done the same? Sorry, could you say it again? Because I cannot re he I sure. hear you. I Italy has imposed some very strict restrictions uh, on people. Yeah. Are you surprised that the UK hasn't done the same? Uh, really, I mean, uh, every government uh, has to uh, make the right decision in the best interest of uh, its own uh, people. Uh, so I, I suppose the uh, UK government uh, has decided this, this course of actions and uh, it is in the best interest of the British people. So it's not for me, honestly, to, to comment on that. What kind of lessons do you think that other countries can learn from Italy's experience? 
what we have done, uh, well, I've, I've, my government uh, has done is, first of all, you know, to be fully transparent, to keep people uh, fully full informed, so that, because what we need at the end of the day is the, uh, the full participation of people. People must understand, must know why those sometimes very hard uh, measures uh, are, are, are taken. Uh, at the moment, you know, the, our, our uh, key word is stay home. We are asking our people to stay home. We believe this is the best way now to contain the contagion. So that the lesson is, I suppose, whatever decision you make, to make sure that your people understand and so they follow you in, those, uh, in, in the implementation of those measures. And how difficult is it from a health perspective? Italy has an excellent health service, but it feels as if it's really under pressure, stretched to breaking point. Well, it is, it, it is quite hard on, those, uh, on the service, but also on those people who have been really working 24 hours uh, a day. We do have an excellent health system, uh, luckily and especially in, uh, in the Lombardia, which is the region that has been uh, most uh, affected, but also in other areas, areas of, the, um, of, 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 of the country. Um, it, is, uh, it is, you know, uh, under pressure. Uh, that's, there's no doubt about that. I think what is important is also, you know, the sharing of, uh, of information, uh, the sharing uh, of best practice between different different regions, but also dif different countries, and the coordinated approach. I think this is very important, not only, as I say, for Italy, but generally speaking in, in, in the world. And uh, uh, I think we are, we are getting there. And just finally, are you seeing any signs that the virus is slowing down in Italy, or do you feel that you're still some way from the peak? I think it's still too early to say so. Um, we need to see the effects of the, um, of the measures, especially uh, the lockdown uh, of the country. And I think in the next few days, probably, we will have a better a picture of, uh, of where we are. Thank you very much for being uh, on the programme today. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The uh, Italian ambassador to the UK there talking about the situation in Italy. Uh, now, GPs are, of course, on the front line of the battle to contain the spread of the virus. And today I spoke to Dr Chand Nagpal. Now, he's the chair of the British Medical Association Council. I spoke to him just a couple of weeks ago uh, and I had to ask him whether he was more worried now than he was since he last spoke to me uh, on the programme. L let's have a listen. I said two weeks ago that this situation could change on a daily basis uh, and in fact that is exactly what has happened. Uh, we are in a very different place compared to two weeks ago when in fact when we met mm. we had about 20 odd cases. Mm. Uh, that is why I don't think we have the luxury of time anymore. Uh, we need to have clear decisive plans. We need to have a very targeted approach. Uh, as I said I represent doctors. They need to be kept healthy. They need to be protected because if we have any reduction in our workforce we won't be able to provide the care patients need. Are you seeing those clear, decisive plans? As I said, I think we need them now. I, 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 we have concerns no. that we don't have all of those answers at the moment. We need them. Now, I asked that question at the end of the interview because I was quite surprised, I suppose, by what I felt to be the change in demeanour of Dr Nagpur. When we spoke two weeks ago, uh, he was very careful not to go too far in his criticism of how prepared the NHS was. He, he was very keen not to make people overly worried if they didn't need to be. But it felt to me as if he was much more agitated in this interview. Uh, and actually, just in that answer there, he was saying how quickly things have changed in the last two weeks when it comes to the number of tests, uh, to the number of cases that have been confirmed, to the number of deaths. Uh, but also, I think, it is clear from what he was saying that there is other things that he feels the government should be doing, particularly uh, in relation to uh, GPs. Let's bring in uh, Nick Martin, uh, shall we, who was listening across to that. And um, a couple of things I thought interesting that he was suggesting. First, that GPs need to be routinely tested uh, because otherwise they won't be able to get back to work at a time when we really need GPs if they're self-isolating. And, and also the change to the way that we do health in this country, more, less face-to-face -face contact with GPs. What was your take? 
I got the sense from him as well, having watched his interview two weeks ago, that, that he was also um, more worried. And, and that perhaps is not surprising, given the, how fast we've seen it escalate in other countries. I was talking to a GP yesterday, and she was telling me that she was very worried about the government's stance on not locking down parts of society that we've seen in, in other countries, and specifically uh, the chances of her catching coronavirus and being out of the system at a time when she is going to be in demand the most. And I think there have also been some confusing messages about how GPs can deal with their patients who are self-isolating, um, talking over Skype or FaceTime or on mobiles. Uh, it, it seems that there is a there's a split between what the government are saying and what the general scientific community are saying, although there are a lot of scientists out there and doctors who agree with the government's stance on where we are at the moment. And the government, they maintain and continually, they will make the right decisions at the right time. I suppose we have to trust that. Uh, on the show today as well, we spoke to Matt Hancock, of course, the health secretary. We heard from him a little bit earlier uh, and we were discussing that. Um, one of the other things, the key messages he was talking about was the need for more ventilators, saying that there is only 5,000 in the health service at the minute. They need many times more. If you make a ventilator, we will buy it. I mean, I, I thought that was quite an extraordinary thing to hear the health secretary say. It is a little bit like what politicians were saying uh, at the outbreak of World War One in 1916. We had a huge shortage of munitions shells and by act of parliament, the government turned round to engineering companies and said, if you can build, if you can make shells, build them. And money was made available to it. It's very similar in a way with ventilators. We have a huge shortage of them. And an expert I was talking to today said it comes down to three things. International patents will make it difficult to make them en masse. Global demand because everyone wants ventilators and will we get them in time that is going to be the problem with ventilators but the government clearly worried that we don't have enough nick thank you uh, very much uh, that's all we've got time for today but of course lots more coverage uh, on sky news about coronavirus about what the government is doing about what we all should be doing uh, to try and keep ourselves as safe as possible see you next week and thank you for watching Good morning. It's 7.35. This is Sky News at Breakfast. Now, uh, a group of behavioural scientists have signed an open letter to the government to express concern about the delay of social distancing measures intended to slow down the spread of COVID-19. Joining me for more on that from South London is one of the signatories of that letter, Professor Nicola Rahani, who is a research fellow at University College London's Department of Experimental Psychology. A very good morning to you, Professor. Now, this morning, we've been seeing pictures of empty streets across Italy. We've been seeing a virtual lockdown in Spain. Should our streets be as empty as that in the UK? Uh, I think that's the big question on everyone's lips at the moment. As you just pointed out, many scientists in the UK and not just behavioural scientists are concerned about the timing of UK delay measures involving social distancing. Now, it seems that um, some of these policies are based at least in part on behavioural science and in particular on this concept of behavioural fatigue. That's the idea that people will get bored of social distancing and so they're going to stop doing it at the time when it's most needed. Now, what uh, the behavioural scientists would like to know is whether there is strong enough evidence to justify such a risky step. What is the evidence for behavioural fatigue and how might it apply in a situation like this? Is it just a little bit patronising then, perhaps, to think that uh, if we're not drip fed the information, if it's all thrown us at, uh, at once at us, that we're going to be overwhelmed and we'll, we'll stop listening? Uh, it, it's, it's, I don't know whether I'd say if it's patronising, but I think it's very risky. I mean, the UK government seems to be taking a radically different approach to most other countries with respect to COVID-19. Uh, and I think the public have a right to know whether the evidence supporting this approach is strong enough. And the, the whole idea of social isolation and of uh, self-isolation, 
Do we know enough about it? Because supposing I go home and, and I stay at home for two weeks and then I go back to the workplace or I go back out again and I become infected, I've got to go back and do that all over again. Is there enough information out there on how to go about it? Uh, I think um, that at the moment that there hasn't been great communication on the kinds of measures people might take to um, to socially distance or to even even to go a step further and to and to socially isolate themselves from others. Um, and that's in part the basis of our letter is asking um, for increased transparency from the government around um, the evidence base for the decisions that are being made. And yes, as you say, an important uh, part of that as well will be um, f it will be to communicate this more effectively to the public. I mean, if we're going to talk about behaviour, we're seeing this uh, quite human uh, side of people, obviously panic buying and, and not aware of what's coming down the line. So what can we do to be reassuring those and especially, say, the over 70s? And we're being told now that they're going to have to, to, uh, to stay in lockdown now. I think as scientists, what as scientists, what we're asking for is um, increased transparency about the evidence based supporting decisions. Um, and this will um, increase the legitimacy of the policies that the government is trying to currently pursue. Um, and I think that will go a long way to reassuring people that the kinds of approach that the government is taking are grounded in a, a solid evidence base and are likely to be effective. So I think this is all tied up together, really. And how much do you think that there should be some sort of a global response? That at the moment, governments are working very independently. They're working on their own scientific research, which, as you said, we're not 100% uh, certain what that research is. Should the governments be, be told what to do? Um, I, I think this, this disease has shown us perhaps uh, more clearly than at any time before just how connected we are on this planet and how much our tenure on this planet relies on our ability to cooperate, not just um, within our countries or within our families, but on a on an international scale. So, yes, I do think that to resolve problems like this and to prevent them from happening again in the future, much more international cooperation is going to be needed. Well, Professor Rehani, we really appreciate you talking to us this morning. Thank you. Okay, well, one of the industries feared to suffer the worst impact of the virus is travel. Of course, we had this blow from the United States that uh, that travel ban has been extended now to the UK. So how is this, as well as other restrictions imposed by the virus, going to affect the UK travel industry? We've seen, of course, Jet 2 uh, suspending all flights to Spain, which is affecting a lot of people. Let's talk to Jonathan Smith, who's from the Association of British Travel Agents. Good morning to you. I mean, just, just how big a blow are we looking at in, as far as the sector is concerned? Good morning, Stephen. Well, I think these um, restrictions are going to be significant. You mentioned the, the US travel ban on, on UK uh, travellers, which comes into force tomorrow. Um, significantly, also, the FCO has changed its uh, advice for Spain, advising against all but essential travel. Spain is the number one destination for Brits. Um, the US is in the top five, too. It's, it's going to have a significant impact on the industry. Uh, so Richard Branson today has, has called for, for around £7.5 billion for the sector to, to bail them out. I mean, it's an awful lot of money. Is that going to be necessary in your view? Well, those sums are specific to the, the airline industry. Um, let's not forget that travel and tourism is much wider than that. Uh, our members represent travel agents and travel operators that are going to be um, hugely affected by this too. Uh, we saw last week um, the government step forward with some emergency measures um, for business, uh, but I think that it's likely that more will need to be done um, to, to make sure that people are going to have jobs in what are normally healthy businesses after we get through this. 
Yeah, because, I mean, I, there has been, hasn't there, an increase in staycations, I, mean, I guess since the financial crisis back in, in 2008. Uh, for those small businesses, particularly in the UK, small hotels, small restaurants, B&Bs, you name it, I mean, they're, they're all likely to suffer quite badly, aren't they? Quite. It's not just um, the airlines and the travel agents and the tour operators. It's businesses here in the UK which benefit from tourists that come inbound. But it's also, you know, the tourism industries in other countries who benefit from, from us going on holiday. Um, we talked a bit about Spain. The tourism industry in Spain is huge for the country. It's going to have a massive impact on them too. So what do we do? I mean, what do we do as a nation? To, can we step in at this stage to try to, to protect these areas? Or, or is it a case of, I mean, do you think of, of, of just having to step back and wait and see what happens? Well, I think there are certainly extraordinary measures that the government can consider, which include delaying um, air passenger duty, giving businesses easy access to credit. Um, as travellers, um, our advice for, for people who, who have imminent plans, so let's say within the next two weeks, is to regularly check the Foreign and Commonwealth Office advice because it is changing so regularly. Um, they can sign up to alerts for that. If people are travelling a little bit further ahead, maybe they're thinking about the summer, I think that's slightly different because we don't know quite what the situation will be by then. No, absolutely. We, we, can't, we can't prejudge the situation as far as that goes. And I guess the home tourist industry isn't as busy as it, as it could be in a, in a few weeks' time. But it's, people... Yeah, but what, now. No, but whatever the advice coming from, from the government and from the FCO and every, everybody else, there's going to be an awful lot of people, aren't there, who just don't want to take the risk. Well, our members have certainly had a lot more calls from concerned customers about their travel plans, and I think that's obviously understandable. Um, they have been um, very adaptable in changing their terms and conditions and policies and doing what they can to answer people's questions and allow them to, to change their plans if the, if the government has advised against travel. Um, so we're seeing the best in the industry, uh, really, in that regard. But we need to make sure that, you know, there is a strong industry left after, after this time. And that's why the government may need to make some, some additional measures to, to protect them. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jonathan, good to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you.